A good evening to you all and we're coming from the council chambers at the Maribing Building based at the University of Johannesburg's Kingsway campus. And we're here today for a public lecture done by Professor John Cow, who is the Vice President as well as Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Hong Kong. Now this is an event jointly presented by the UJ Faculty of Health Sciences, the UJ Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment as well as the UJ Division for Internationalization. Let's see what he has in store for us. Well, thank you everybody for uh, coming here at the uh, kind of the end of the day on a, on a cold winter uh, evening. So uh, we, we feel so honored and privileged and, and felt so welcome to, to be here. And uh, we had a very vigorous uh, discussion today um, and, and, and trying to figure out exactly how our institutions can, can work closer uh, going forward. And if I reflect on what I learned in, in, in uh, this little short trip, I must say that um, what defines a great university, particularly a public university, is not just the research, nor the teaching, but the core values, what the university stands for. I think uh, both Hong Kong and South Africa has gone through tremendous transformation in the recent decades, and universities have the obligation to provide the support, the moral compass, and the ability to lift the society to an even higher ground. And it is because of that, I feel that between HKU and, and UJ, we have a lot of commonality on not just our past, but how we view the future and how we want to, to work together uh, going forward. So, so I'm very excited and, and, and we feel very welcome. I think uh, the, the little delegation that we have is the first ever HKU uh, uh, institutional delegation to, to South Africa and to Africa to that f uh, effect. So we feel very honored to, to share the next few hours with you um, talking about translational medicine. So, so, um, so again, uh, truly appreciate the time that you uh, afford us. And uh, hopefully this conversation is the first of many. And we already uh, have uh, ideas how we want to, to continue this collaboration. So uh, let me just jump right in. Um, but before I dive into the topic, I think it's always very important to answer the question, why? Why are we interested in this topic? Why, why did I choose this topic uh, to devote a good 20-some years of my life and my students' life to? Um, it's when you think about wounds and, and when you think about implants and, and all the advances in uh, pharma, pharmacological uh, therapies or device medical device therapies, uh, you basically are putting a foreign entity into the body, whether it's a very short duration like a contact lens for a few hours or uh, artificial hearts or, or, or prosthetics that can hopefully last for the entire duration of a, of, of a patient's lifetime. Um, these are foreign entities, and, and, and because of their presence, it elicits this wide range of activities uh, from the onset of injuries to, to, to bleeding events to uh, inflammations and, and granulations gradually going towards a uh, healing process. And under normal conditions, these uh, systems progress uh, without too much problem. I mean, when you have a paper cut, you say something in, uh, that I should not repeat uh, because it's not pleasant, but ultimately you don't think about it because the body just heals itself. But the story is different when you have artificial implants or even a tooth filling because these are foreign entities and that the intensities and the duration of these activities uh, can affect how the materials or the biomedical uh, interventions uh, are, are, uh, are, are um, then, then uh, take effect. So w I was very interested in this topic of wound healing. We, we, we wanted to understand more about this. Um, so we understand that in the microenvironment, it is very complex. You have different cell types. Um, I don't know if I can use my laser, but uh, you have different cell types interacting with each other, and it's a very dynamic process. All these cells release a variety of, of uh, potpourris of uh, proteins and cytokines to, to regulate each other. Um, so it's hierarchical. 
uh, because things are happening on the molecular level, at the cellular level, at the tissue level. It's also multi-component and, and very highly dynamic. So, so then you think of this as a biomedical engineer and say, okay, we understand the biology, but ultimately we want to apply this knowledge for a purpose, for, for an application. So how do you turn basic biology and physiology into a engineering tool. And, and this is the area where drug delivery and regenerative uh, medicine come in place. So basically the idea is we understand the complexity of the environment. Are there ways that we could uh, deliver some of these uh, molecules or cells as, as uh, therapeutic agents to drive these processes to an outcome that is favorable, you know, a better healing, for example, for, for patients, or more biocompatible devices, uh, so these implants last uh, a lot longer. Uh, so you basically then need an enabler to do that, and biomaterials, um, at the case Western, it, it becomes an obvious choice because there are different ways we could, uh, we could um, influence this microenvironment. Um, so, so my talk is basically will be in two parts, um, the, the R part, the research part, and the D part or the development part, the R&D part of, of a basic science research. So at the beginning, I focus on the basic science. So uh, we developed this platform technology called uh, Interdependent Trading Network. So it's basically a, a mimic of the uh, cellular microenvironment or the extracellular matrix. Um, so, so, the, so the whole idea is that um, uh, it contains two components, and it contains a synthetic component, shown here in red, uh, that's polyethylene glycol. Um, and, and then uh, there's a biological component, supposedly that should be in orange, uh, that is a biomolecule derivative. And, and we came to this formulation because uh, trial and errors and, and based on learning uh, from biology. And we perform chemistry modification on these entities so they can be uh, uh, manipulated. And, and then the idea is that it creates an artificial microenvironment then we can uh, encapsulate different kind of drugs from small molecules to proteins or to cytokines, and we can incorporate cells as both uh, 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 d different components to influence the tissue that we want to, to influence. So it becomes a multifunctional network based on um, some of the basic principles of, uh, of tissue and, and biology. Uh, but then the uh, materials are then designed to serve different both mechanical functions as well as biological functions. And then, uh, then we spent a lot of years trying to characterize this material. So all these are relatively basic science research. To give you some idea, uh, by varying the, uh, the, the formulations, whether it's the polymer ratios or the molecular weights, we could have a wide range of mechanical properties from uh, 1 to 350 megapascals of Young's modulus for elasticity uh, to degradation rates and so on and so forth. So this gives us a wide menu of options uh, when we think about applications. So again, is understanding biology to come up with an enabler for ultimate application end. Um, so these mechanical properties are critical for applications uh, in terms of tissue compliance, degradations, and, and so on and so forth. And we also want to make sure that the materials, once it's formed, uh, form a very intimate uh, contact with the tissue bed because ultimately we want to influence the biology it cannot be at a distance. It has to be really close and personal. Um, so, so we have a, a, a range of uh, uh, adhesion. Uh, I'm just wondering, has anybody, I don't know the name in South Africa, but they sell these super glues that are very, very sticky. And I don't know if you use super glue, but uh, don't get it on your finger. Or if you get it on your finger, it's really hard to pull it off, right? I, I saw people nodding. I mean, I have a lot of experience with super glue. So just in case if it happens to you, in case you get super glue on your fingers and you try, try to pull it off, it takes about 
uh, 5.6 Newton of force, just to give you an idea. Uh, so you have to apply 5.6 Newton of force to pull it off. Do not do this uh, at home, and, and it's just an experiment. Uh, but our material takes about 3 Newton of force to peel from the skin once it's formed. So, so it's on there pretty tight. And that's very critical because if you want to deliver cells you, and drugs, you need that intimate contact. So, so we thought that's, um, that's very critical for the application. And degradation rates uh, give us a wide range of the amount of time it takes for complete degradation. So you think about implants, whether it's for short-term application or long-term applications. Again, this opens up the platform for, for different types of uh, um, modifications. And we looked at different delivery. Uh, we published more than 80 papers on, on looking at this material uh, function relationship and how it's applied to deliver drugs and so on and so forth. So we felt, well, you know, after so many years, uh, we have a good handle on, on this thing. Uh, so we started to entrap uh, therapeutic cells within the matrix, like uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, that can be differentiated into different lineages. And we found that uh, we are able to incorporate live cells within this matrix and that upon different stimulations, they can uh, uh, differentiate into adipocytes or chondrocytes or osteoblasts, even in the presence of inflammatory cells such as white blood cells. So, so even in the presence of a, a, of a natural defense mechanism, uh, the therapeutic cells maintain their functions, and, and we felt very excited about that. And then we did, uh, so this slide represents two PhD theses. Um, so we looked into exactly what is that interaction between the, the matrix, the cells, the, the, the white blood cells, and, and how they modulate each other. So by this time, uh, we felt that we have a basic understanding of the materials and, and its ability. Uh, so we went and did a small animal and ultimately large animal study. Uh, so we created a, we use a model called uh, partial thickness wounds. So in the medical area, uh, for example, if you get a, a, a say a, a third degree burn on your face, um, the, the uh, gold standard is to harvest the skin from your thigh and put it on your face. That's the best treatment for, so for that. But obviously when you do that, uh, you might fix one wound, but you created another wound. Okay, so that's the, the donor side wound. So this model uh, replicates, and, and pigs are the, the best, uh, whatever that's supposed to represent, the pig skin and human skins are the, the closest. Uh, so pro sign models are, are used in this regard. So, so basically we create, um, sorry, I have to show some blood, so I hope people don't get squeamish because it's hard to talk about wound healing without actually see some wounds, and, and I actually um, think that's pretty important. Um, so, so imagine uh, the gentleman uh, in, in the room, if you ever shave, uh, and then if you cut yourself with a razor, imagine you deliberately scrape the skin off uh, with a razor. So that's what we did. Uh, so it's very bloody and, and, and uh, not so pleasant. But that's how they harvest skin uh, to, to applications. So, so to make a long story very short, so we compare our IPM with the other clinical standards. And uh, I don't know how many medical uh, doctors are in the room, but clearly after three weeks, you could tell that the outcomes are very different. I mean, they just look different, uh, different colorations, different uh, level of scars and, and whatnot. And it's all be because of the different materials that were used. So, so, so early intervention, depending on the methods, will have a long-term uh, effect. And we thought that's very powerful because uh, it demonstrates the material is not just passive, but it can really influence the biology and, and the physiology underneath. And then we did clinical assessments. Uh, we showed that uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, histochemical analyses and uh, pathohistologies and even the cosmesis, uh, the appearance of the wound is a lot better when we use the, uh, the IPNs. 
so we at this stage, uh, we thought, well, uh, we're very excited. Uh, we know there's clinical needs out there, and perhaps uh, there is a solution. Um, so a typical researcher in, in a university setting would do these kind of um, kind of a course of study. You, you come up with an idea, you do a whole bunch of studies, you publish papers, and now you're trying to find the application. And, and then later I will address the uh, pros and cons of this uh, push model. You're basically trying to push a technology from inside the, the university to the outside world. Um, so, so we were very typical uh, academics trying to, to make a difference in the world. So we looked around and said, exactly how can this technology be used to address real problems? Um, so we turned into wounds, uh, particularly skin wounds, cutaneous wounds. Um, so according to uh, the US CDC Center for uh, Disease, uh, the cause of trauma-related death in the U.S. is actually two, two times higher than cancer and cardiovascular diseases combined. So it costs a lot of money to, to, to heal wounds. Uh, and then, uh, and worldwide, it's a major contributor to disability-adjusted years. Uh, and then the, the crux of it is because the current practice fails more than 50% of the time. So the, the refractory level is extremely high, so wound healing is really an art, and, and because the outcome is very hard to predict. I can get into this more if you're curious. Uh, so we look at different kind of wounds. I'm sorry, I, I should give you a disclaimer. Uh, next few slides will be really, um, I actually went to the hospital and started taking pictures with my collaborators. Uh, so close your eyes if you don't want to do it, uh, but I'll let you know when it's all over. So, so we looked at, well, wounds, there are different kind of wounds. Uh, so, so you know, let's educate ourselves and, and see where we can, uh, can contribute. Typical trauma, surgical wounds. When we go in and get part of your liver removed, these are creating surgical wounds, and, and these are fairly easy to address. Uh, but trauma wounds uh, is very difficult. Uh, Wisconsin is a farming uh, state, so we see a lot of farm injuries uh, back in the day. So this farmer got three fingers, I mean two fingers cut off in, the, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in one of those big devices. Um, and and the problem is that uh, suture normally does the trick, but sometimes these wounds are so complex uh, and that's not very easy to, to, to heal. Another one is chronic wounds. Uh, bear with me, only two more slides. Um, and these are what they call English muffin wounds. So, so basically when a patient has a hard time healing, uh, you could actually put your hand into this kind of wound and the patient will have no feeling. Uh, and, and it's really uh, not pleasant for, for everybody. Uh, but but these, are, these are very, very difficult wounds, not because just the wound, but the underlying pathology of diabetes and, and cardiovascular dysfunctions and whatnot. And lastly, uh, more complicated wounds, like uh, infected wounds, where, where you have the combination of everything on top of it is infected. So really, the, the way to do this to cure is amputation, and, and, and uh, certainly if we can come up with, with any methods to improve the outcome, uh, that would be ideal. And I do want to point out this 10 to the fourth uh, organism uh, per gram of tissue as a clinical definition of an infection. Uh, I'll come back to that number in a bit. So we thought, okay, let's, uh, let's see what happens when we uh, put our uh, uh, IPNs with, uh, whoops, with, with uh, drugs and antibiotics. So uh, we put in uh, mesochemical stem cells along with drugs into these uh, IPNs. Oh, so for those who close their eyes, uh, uh, the fun pictures are gone. Uh, so it's just uh, boring histograms and, 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 and uh, plots and uh, green pictures. So we're able to show that, um, that when you incorporate a drug uh, cocktail, um, there is actually uh, a, uh, no effect on the function of the therapeutic cells that we put in. So this is the IPN with both cells and, and drug cocktail together because we want to tackle uh, difficult wounds that are both wounds and infection. Um, and then uh, we actually went to uh, uh, 
uh, animal model and we created infected wounds with 10 to the fourth uh, CFU per uh, mil of, uh, of the tissue. And then we treat it with the IPN. And then uh, clearly when you put the last bar, uh, when you put both the drugs and the therapeutic cells, there's an increase in, the, in how fast the wound heals. Uh, so so we, we found that very encouraging. And the healing looks very uh, normal, so, so I won't get into the histology and, and, and that there's a lot of uh, epithelial growth uh, after seven days uh, post-injury. And that we saw a dramatic reduction in the infected uh, 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 colony, uh, S. epididymis is a is a pathogen of choice. So from four, uh, we dropped it down to less than uh, 0 0.5. So in essence, it's no longer infected. Um, so then we got really excited and said, "Well, what's next?" Um, and and, and we, all these are resulted in published papers, but we want to translate. So I really have to acknowledge. Uh, my my collaborators, all the support that got offered to me uh, at Wisconsin. Um, so then we need to kind of switch gear and look at the larger ecosystem of uh, how to get research from research into a product, particularly in the biomedical or, or the life sciences space. Uh, so the state of things globally in, in this translation from basic to, to, to uh, apply is there's no short of ideas. There, there are plenty of smart people everywhere, um, here, Hong Kong, everywhere. So people are always coming up with uh, the next best thing. Um, a university like HKU, I'm sure UJ, we have uh, patents that just kind of sit there because it's really hard to license. And, and, and Wisconsin is the, one of the earliest universities that set up a tech transfer office more than 80 years ago with more than two billion U.S. dollars in endowment. And they're finding difficult to license technology. And, and then as a researcher, I don't appreciate that because I thought, well, you know, I cure all these things, so people should be knocking down my door and wanting to buy these IPNs, and, and why aren't they coming? And, and what, what's, what am I missing in the picture? It is because I learned this phrase called valley of death. Uh, I just wonder how many of you have heard this expression, valley of death. It just sounds so deadly, and, and it just sounds like, you know, how am I going to cross this valley of death? And, and first of all, what is it? So valley of death basically means to get a technology from discovery, basically university, to a product. It takes about 14 years at a cost of more than two billion U.S. dollars. At a, <laughs> in Hong Kong, there's a lot of horse racing. And at the odd of one out of 10,000, so one out of 10,000 technologies, I mean, university doesn't even have 10,000 <laughs> patents. But anyway, so, so it takes that much time. So clearly, this is very risky, very expensive, no single entity, doesn't matter if you hover MIT, or, or HKU or even pharma can, can have this appetite. And that's not even considering the product is selling money. You know, just getting to the market takes that long. Uh, so, so you see drugs pulling off uh, clinical trials, not because, um, because of a variety of reasons, but it's just very, very difficult. So, so I was uh, very discouraged, need to say, uh, and I said, how am I ever going to cross this valley of death? And, and then we have to kind of reflect, why is it so difficult? And, and because um, there are basic science reasons, uh, as well as universities are just not um, designed to address some of these commercialization requirements, everything from regulatory, uh, value proposition, quality systems, business plan, scale up. I mean, I have a lab of 10 people. There's no way I could do all of this. Or, 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 or so, so, um, 
there has to be a different plan. There has to be a kind of a, a transformation in terms of how we think about translational medicine and, and, and driving impact. Um, so um, I was able to convince the, the higher powers at, at UW-Madison to, to kind of use the IPN as a guinea pig to see if we can come up with a new paradigm. Um, so we set up a, a, a project to, to look at some of the developmental requirements of the technology so it can be well positioned to, for commercialization. Everything from design history file, packaging, serialization method, manufacturing methodologies, and, and, and first demand protocol. So none of this will result in published paper, uh, but these are absolutely required if you want to translate life science or medical science or technology into the market, or at least for, for investors to, to even answer your email. And so without getting into detail, we work with a bunch of people. Uh, we had a team and to develop quality systems. So these are all very project management type of lingo, um, you know, different phases, um, uh, different uh, design implementation, commercialization, and every step has a very clear Gantt chart. I'm an engineer, so I love Gantt chart. Uh, it just means that for a particular item, you have a point person, you have exact timing, uh, and then it's, everything is benchmarked. Okay, none of this will result in published paper, but you have to do it this way if you want to do the, the big D or the, the big development. Um, and then this slide represents basically four years of my life at Wisconsin, uh, aligning different partners, whether it's uh, uh, university units or outside parties like pharma or, or angels or VCs, and, and to set up this ecosystem to, to do uh, drug uh, and, and device development. And... Uh, leveraging uh, the resources that's already there. So we did not build anything. It's not a bricks and mortar type of investment. It's all about alignment. So uh, we talked to different resource areas along the development path from uh, uh, animal modeling to imaging to, to pharmaceutics, uh, and then create this massive team that we can shuttle project down the development path. So to make a long story short, uh, after all this, we end up with a bag with two containers. And, and when I saw this, it's almost, I have two kids, and it's almost like it's harder to do this than to, to, to kind of, I mean, um, I think I won't get into detail, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you, you see, okay, you get a, a vial and a bucket in an aluminum foil bag. I mean, that's really the product, okay? And, and, and we were so excited. I mean, there a lot of champagne corks opened that day. And, and then it's, a, it's a licensed by Merck and Sigma, and, and the product line, would, uh, they launched this uh, this year. Um, so the story is that it takes a village to raise a child, as the saying goes, and it takes a village to translate a te technology from a small lab into the market and, and involves a lot of people. And I just want to acknowledge them, even though they probably, I don't know, maybe they'll see this talk. Uh, my students, uh, my, my clinical collaborators in medicine and public health and the hospitals, the surgeons, and, 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 the, uh, and then the, my, I had a startup companies, the entrepreneurs, the, the, the VCs, um, and then the tech transfer office, and then the, uh, my uh, commercial partners, uh, Sigma, Merck, um, everything, their, their global technology collaboration team, their legal and licensing team, uh, the, the packaging team is pretty interesting. I mean, I actually, it's, uh, it, it took us a month, but they figured out the best way to package this in a box. So they actually had a guy who figured out how to package this, and his job is to drop it, drop the box, any way he seems that he could imagine. And, and it has to withstand, you know, dropping it from the second floor, you know, dropping it at an angle, sitting on it. I mean, even people like that without which 
uh, this would not be possible. And, and I think this really takes that teamwork. And, and, and the different companies I work with, it's just being, and the funding agencies who kind of bless me along the way, um, I, I get really touched when I, when I show this slide. So the conclusion um, is uh, I still believe we have a right platform to, to help with, with uh, not just basic science understanding of things, but to, uh, to apply in, in the real world. And that academia, we cannot operate in silos. We have to be proactive. We have to challenge our thinking. We have to be innovative and, and to work at that very uncomfortable interface, uh, whether it's with industries with, or, 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 or uh, discipline uh, that's not familiar to you, uh, because it does take that village to, to make it all possible. And that um, I only show you the successes. Uh, there's been plenty of bruises along the way. I mean, I am covered in them. Um, there are a lot of uh, do's and don'ts. Um, and so we're replicating some of these models in Hong Kong U. Uh, we recently launched a translational medicine consortium with uh, regional universities and, and hopefully through uh, the Chinese medicine or some other collaboration we can engage uh, to to form this teamwork to to really move forward um, so so um, that's really the science part of things and uh, and then at the end um, I do want to uh, just say uh, how much we uh, the three of us and on behalf of the University of Hong Kong uh, how much we appreciate this past uh, 12 hours to, to share um, uh, meals and, and sit down meetings with you to talk about uh, what we ha must do as universities to, to, to drive impact, to serve the community. And I think that alignment of core values uh, make us uh, natural partners. So, so I, I, I just I cannot say enough on that. And, and then I promised Pinky I would make an announcement, and I'm going to do that. Um, so recently we launched a, uh, several funding schemes uh, to, let me just go through this very quickly. Um, uh, several funding schemes to facilitate, um, uh, to bring students from different backgrounds to our campus. Uh, so this is a, a, a full expense paid, uh, full scholarship, including airfare accommodations. Uh, welcome you to, to think about that. And we also recently launched a uh, visiting scholarship for short-term visit by students. So you could come, uh, we'll pay for air ma uh, airfare and everything, uh, anywhere up to uh, a few weeks on campus, uh, just to get a sense of what we're doing. So all the information is on this website. Uh, it's a global portal, uh, basically global.hku.hk. And we also have different schemes for uh, uh, short-term exchanges or, or short-term visit by professors and students. We have a uh, seat funding for initial handshaking events. Uh, if uh, people don't know if there are uh, uh, coll potential collaborators. Uh, so, so all these are at your disposal. And uh, I really hope that uh, we can, through these enabling platforms, uh, to, to bring our institution and bring our cities and bring our regions uh, ever closer together because I know there's a lot of work to be done. So uh, once again, thank you so much. And sorry about the bloody pictures. So thank you. <laughs> In summary, three important lessons. The last one is for the deans and the executive directors here. The first one is the absolute importance, and especially to our younger researchers in the audience here tonight, is the absolute importance of moving out of our silos into a multidisciplinary notion, because that's really where the success of research lies in future. Working in our silos is not going to get solutions. It's not going to take us forward. I think the second one, and you've so eloquently highlighted by saying I'm so bruised, is the whole notion of resilience. To get this far in any type of work we do, you've got to have resilience. You've got to continue. You've got to persevere. Sometimes there's no funding. Sometimes there's people that don't want to work with you, but you've really got to stick it out and persevere. It's a very important issue. And the last one I want to say to you, Professor, is that this is to my executive directors and deans. You know, we're in the process of starting with our budgeting process. And our DVC is quite tight on, on new posts. 
No, no, the other DVC. But he would have like, helped us in, to assist us with this. But I've never heard the context, and I'm really going to try it in my faculty, to motivate for a person that I could use for one more role is to test different boxes in the faculty. <laughs> and I'm really going to try that with our DVC this year and take that forward. Dr. Yeah. Professor Sina, over to you. Uh, th thanks very much. Uh, we do actually have some uh, destructive and non-destructive <laughs> testing abilities. Uh, some of it is by design and some of it is by coincidence. Uh, la ladies and gentlemen, I, my task is just to thank everybody for being here. And also, once again, thanks very much, uh, Professor John Cow, and also to the Cow Lab. I had the chance to look at your profile and your group of students that are also following you and your trip. Uh, and also to uh, Professor Derek Collins and Dr. Fassel uh, Tesfaye for being part of the delegation. And we're interacting over the next, uh, I guess, 24 hours uh, in trying to seek more collaborations. Right here, I'm joined by the Vice President as well as the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong, Professor John Cao. And he's joined me right here next to me. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, now to just start off by asking you, what was the choice behind tonight's topic? The choice behind tonight's topic is really to share with the uh, UJ community my own personal journey and how my personal journey has uh, affected how I view my uh, professional job as the VP engaged in international collaborations. And just um, looking back at your lecture, there is a particular term known as interpenetrating network, if I got that correctly. Got that right. Fantastic. Now, we would like to know what is it and what are its functions? So basically, is a matrix, um, a material matrix based on what we know of the biology of tissues. So it's a synthetic version of our natural skin, and we're hoping to use that for uh, different medical applications, such as uh, uh, to deliver a uh, drug into the patients more effectively, to improve uh, healing of the wounds, and, and that's the, the material platform that we have developed. And does this apply to certain types of wounds, or can it apply to all of them? Well, we would like to, to make it as helpful for as many people as they have uh, suffered different clinical needs. But right now, we're very focused on, on uh, acute wounds that are uh, uh, more manageable. Uh, but in the future, we're extending that to other indications, for example, uh, internal surgical around uh, liver transplants, and, and these are the areas that we're very excited about. Right. There's something you also mentioned in the lecture as well, that with this IPN development, the challenges were one of them being was the valley of death. What did you mean by that term? Yeah, it does sound scary, and it is very scary. Uh, so looking at how much time and effort it takes to get a uh, research into the uh, commercial world, uh, Valley of Death is coined to describe the medical um, device and, and drug technology. So in essence, it takes about 15 years to get a research from the, the lab into the, the commercial world at a cost of about two billion U.S. dollars. And then, uh, and then it's only one out of 10,000 uh, research uh, entities. So, so it does take collaboration to, for, for people to navigate this valley of death, but uh, there are a lot of smart people out there, so I, I have a f good feeling about it. And with this product, is it the kind of product that you can access over the counter, or can you access it via doctors? How does it work when it comes to accessibility? Right. Right now, because of the uh, technical requirements uh, that's needed, uh, so it's only for uh, professionals. But we also are developing this for research tools, so more people can use the technology to explore new ways of, uh, of using that technology. And before we let you go, just lastly, what were the learned lessons from this experience? 
Right. So teamwork is absolutely critical, uh, especially working with people uh, from different disciplines with different uh, knowledge base, because these problems and challenges are so great that no single individuals or even single discipline can, can tackle. So I encourage people, my own students and myself included, to think more broadly, more inclusively, to work with people from different backgrounds and, and, and to solve the problem as a team. All right, thank you so much for joining us once again, thank Professor Carr. Thank you so much. Right here, I'm joined by the Executive Dean of UJ Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, Professor Saurabh Sinha. Professor Sinha, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for being here and supporting our event as usual. Fantastic. Now, to start off, what does tonight's public lecture mean for the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment in UJ? Yeah, I think it's a, it brings about a collaboration between engineering and health sciences, but I think it's about where uh, technology starts to work in, in favor of, uh, of being of benefit to humanity. And I think that's the connection that we are very connected to. After all, the vision of the university includes a component that says anchored in Africa. And I think the moment you have solutions where technology starts to enable these, uh, these areas, I think that that becomes something of interest to us. And the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature of translational, translational medicine uh, is something that we uh, quite associate with in our own strife and building our own discipline. All right. And what do you hope the attendees can take home from tonight's lecture? I think that, uh, you know, the different attendees, as I was looking in the venue, uh, we all come from different backgrounds. Uh, we come from different technical disciplines. And I think uh, when we come from these te different technical disciplines, one realizes that for solutions to realize, we have to be able to work together. And I think that the attendees, the fact that we had folks from uh, medicine, that we had folks from uh, engineering, we had folks from management, we had folks from uh, the areas of technology transfer, I think we start to realize that there is indeed a potential for research to move into uh, research and innovation that ends up moving into the development uh, areas. So I think uh, that part of the path of translating what we do in a university and its impact to society, I think, would be one of the takeaways. All right. And lastly, can we expect more public lectures like this in the future? I, I'm not going to say we count on the public, but we always do count on the public because lectures wouldn't be successful otherwise. Uh, we are uh, planning to have a whole series of lectures, and more and more we are doing it in collaboration with other faculties. I think it just goes to show the nature of how technology has immersed and, conver and brings uh, convergence into very many disciplines. And I think that uh, that when faculties are starting to work together uh, in and delivering to the public, I think uh, it. Uh, I th so I think the answer is definitely yes. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Sina. Good. Thanks again, and thanks for being here. And uh, looking forward to further linkages uh, f with uh, Bon City TV. <laughs> And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the public lecture by Professor John Carr from the University of Hong Kong. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time.